Greetings, this is Greg. You're joining me in a Thunderbolt D40. We're a little bit damaged from previous attack runs. We're trying to knock out the German headquarters at Greyhall. And bang, we just got hit again. So at this point, we're going to take our damaged P-47, turn north, and run for the nearest Allied base where we can get repairs and also rearm and refuel and come back in for another attack. Performing a solo attack like I just did on the German headquarters really isn't such a hot idea, but if you're going to do that, P-47, that's your answer. It can bring the punishment and it can absorb enough damage and have a good chance of getting you back to base. Of course, if you don't try and get back to base, if you just, just bail out, ditch, or worst of all, just despawn and get a new airplane, I think you're really denying yourself a lot of the DCS experience. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to manage the damage, try and get back to base, and we're going to talk quite a bit, a little bit later on, about how best to use the P-47 in air-to-air -air combat. Next, we're going to go to the still images, because that's going to make it a little bit easier to look at the gauges and explain just what it is we need to look out for. Here is the instrument panel, obviously the airplanes on the ground. The white circles show the area where we're going to have the most focus for right now. Let's take a look at the right side of the panel and we're going to go over all of these positions in quite a bit of detail. This stuff is pretty important in the interest of keeping your Thunderbolt's engine alive. We'll start at position one here. That's the carburetor air temperature gauge. If this gets too hot, that could lead to knock or engine failure. Now, if it starts to rise, you can open up your intercooler shutters and or reduce manifold pressure. The good news is that if you fly around with the intercooler shutters in neutral, they won't cause any significant decrease in aircraft performance, and this temperature will never overheat. I say never, that assumes normal usage. Maybe if you're using uh, the plane in some sort of desert conditions, you're going to have to worry about this. Uh, maybe on the Syria map, someplace like that. Now, if this temperature starts to rise, you can mitigate that by opening the shutters and or reducing manifold pressure. Procedurally, keep this gauge in your scan. Just know that it's going to be very rare that this is going to be a problem for you. Now down at position two, this is where the action is. This little gauge cluster has oil temperature at the top, oil pressure lower left, fuel pressure lower right. We'll start with fuel pressure because that one's a pretty big deal. If you've just taken battle damage, you want to check fuel and oil pressure. With fuel pressure, if it's falling or if it's failed, the engine will either quit or run irregularly. In either case, if that fuel pressure gauge is not in the normal range, you're going to have to manually increase the fuel pressure. And you do that by rotating this knob here clockwise. And you just rotate it far enough until fuel pressure is back into the normal range. You'll have to do this in one of three scenarios. One, possibly after battle damage if the damage has affected this, this system. Also, DCS can simulate certain aircraft failures. Now, you're not going to see that in normal missions or on multiplayer uh, servers, but you may see this happen on certain pre-made missions by very sadistic mission builders. They'll put system failures in there for you. Also, you may see a fuel pressure problem at very high altitudes. We're talking up above 30,000 feet. I haven't seen that happen in DCS, but that is in the book, so it's a reality. Again, all you need to know is rotate that knob until fuel pressure is back to normal. So now you know. Next up, we have the oil temperature gauge. If the oil temperature gets too high, the engine will fail, even without any battle damage. There are three primary factors affecting oil temperature. The indicated airspeed, because higher airspeed means more air through the oil coolers. The oil cooler shutters, as they also regulate airflow through the coolers. And of course, the engine's power setting. More power means higher temperatures with everything else equal. A worst case scenario would then be low airspeed, closed shutters, and a high power setting. That will spell death for the Thunderbolt's engine. Now if you're new to the Thunderbolt in DCS, I suggest just leaving the oil cooler shutters fully open all the time. They have a pretty minimal impact on performance. Now more experienced people tend to leave them in the neutral position by default and only open them fully when needed. The neutral position doesn't cost any measurable performance compared with the closed position, so that's fine. And you still get enough cooling for normal flying. The problem is that during the stress of combat, 
you might forget to open them up when and if you need the extra cooling. What I suggest you do once you've got a little bit of time in the, in the airplane is fly with them fully open all the time and then only go to neutral if you're in a long chase where the extra few miles per hour might make a difference. Keep in mind, even with the shutters fully open, it is still possible to over temp the oil if you're running at very high power settings and lower air speeds, say below 200 miles per hour. So you have to keep an eye on this gauge and sometimes you're going to have to pull the power back to keep the temperatures in check. At the lower left, we have oil pressure. This typically fails due to battle damage and it can fail slowly or suddenly. Anytime you take damage, you want to check this gauge. Just remember that the pressure loss is not always immediate. The damage model in DCS has a lot of different ways to make oil pressure fail, and they're all spelled out in the Mission Builder. Once the oil pressure goes to zero, you have about five minutes before your engine stops turning. It's possible to prolong that a little bit by running very low power and low RPM. Also, anytime your oil pressure is dropping or is at zero, you should open the oil cooler shutters all the way if they aren't already. Position three shows the cylinder head temperature gauge. This is all about cowl flap management, although airspeed and power are factors as well. Position the cowl flaps fully open for takeoff and anytime you're taxiing the airplane. After takeoff, you start to close them as you accelerate through about 200 miles per hour indicated. They should be fully closed anytime you're above 225 indicated. If in a dogfight that has deteriorated to low speeds and high power settings, say you're down to 170 miles per hour and running war emergency power, you will need to open them slightly, but not too much. I hold the control in the open position direction for about three seconds, and then I just forget about the cylinder head temps. Next up, at position four, manifold pressure. If your turbocharger takes damage, you may find that full manifold pressure is no longer available. The engine may be otherwise just fine, but you find that you can't get the pressure and thus the engine power up to the levels you can normally reach. If this happens, you want to start dragging the fight to lower altitudes. Once down below about 3,000 feet, your mechanically driven supercharger can provide enough air to give you 52 inches of manifold pressure with no real problems. So you're back in the fight at that point. Ideally, you want to drag the fight down near sea level if you're in this situation. At position five, we have the tachometer showing us engine RPM. It's not propeller RPM. I get questions about that a lot. It's possible for the prop governor to take damage in a number of ways. When this happens, you will usually get either RPM overspeed or underspeed. Either one could damage the engine, but overspeed is the more difficult one to notice. A slow increase from 2700 to 3500 sort of creeps up on you, and unless you're checking the tack, you might not notice until it's too late. So this is another thing you want to look at anytime you've taken damage. Now, underspeed manifests itself more clearly. The plane's performance starts to decrease massively. It seems a lot like a failing engine, and nine times out of ten, you're going to notice it pretty quickly. Either way, you have to go to manual control of the propeller, so let's take a look at that. The switch for manual control is circled, but before we get to that, notice the arrow. It's pointing to the amp meter. This shows the output of the plane's electrical generator. It will show zero if the engine is at very low RPM, like near idle. At normal engine speeds, you should see some electrical load on the gauge. Typically in the daytime, it's a very low load, perhaps a needle width or two from zero, but there should be some load indicated. If you're in the air and this is at zero, your generator has failed. You need to check this anytime you take damage. If the generator fails or is knocked out by enemy fire, your battery will start to run down. At a certain point, you will lose control of your prop. This particular Thunderbolt has a Curtis electric prop, no electrical power, no propeller control. What you probably want to do in the event of a generator failure, or for sure if you have a runaway prop, is go to fixed pitch. Note that the switch is a four position unit, auto, fixed, and then it has momentary positions for increase and decrease. Auto is where you normally run the plane. RPM is then set via the prop lever on the throttle quadrant, pretty normal. Fixed keeps the prop pitch right where it is when you select this position. 
You can then adjust the pitch if needed via the increase and decrease RPM positions, which are momentary type action switches. When you go to fixed pitch as a result of a generator failure, I suggest the following procedure. Set max continuous power, so 42 inches and 2550 RPM. Fly straight and level and wait for the airplane's speed to stabilize. Then put the switch in the fixed position and the propeller pitch will stay right there for the rest of the flight unless you touch the switch again. The propeller in this case will be in a good compromised position. It's great for cruise, it's okay for climbs and descents and light combat, meaning not fighting against an enemy fighter plane. If the problem was a generator failure, not a bad propeller governor, turn the battery off at this point to save electrical power. Then if combat is imminent, you can turn it back on, put the prop switch back to auto for the fight. If it was a prop governor issue, you're stuck in fixed pitch. You can't go back to auto. However, if you get into a serious fight that you can't avoid, you can increase manifold pressure up to 52 inches. If you set it up the way I suggested, it won't overspeed unless you enter a dive. You can then fine tune the RPM with the increase and decrease position. If in a climb or a dogfight, you'll have to increase it a little bit. About one second on the switch will be about right, but don't do it until the plane starts to slow down. In hindsight, this whole prop thing probably should have been its own video. Let's get back to our mission. So we're headed north towards Lassay, checking hydraulic pressure there. We're going to be looking all around, checking for traffic. We're going to check radar for both enemies and friendlies as we go along. Generally, monitor the airplane. The idea here is to stay fast and low and get to Lassay as quickly as possible to minimize the chances of being intercepted. And once we're there, we're going to repair, rearm, refuel, and go back to Brayholm. Now, Another thing to consider is that if we get intercepted, we don't really want to land because we'll just be shredded when we're trying to land. So we'll try and force the dogfight into an area that's advantageous for us. In other words, we'll lead the enemy into friendly anti-aircraft fire or to other friendly aircraft that can help us out. I really don't want a dogfight, even, even a one versus one dogfight, when I'm starting off with the damaged airplane. Now, this idea of overflying a friendly base in order to get anti-aircraft support is sort of a simulator thing. In actual warfare, this would be pretty dangerous. It wasn't unusual for anti-aircraft fire to shoot down friendly aircraft. As a matter of fact, um, and it relates to this particular mission uh, because of the paint scheme we're flying, there was a pilot during World War II named Mike Gladich, and he was a Polish Air Force guy that then flew for the RAF and ultimately flew with the United States Air Force for a large portion of the war. And he was quite quite the wild man. Uh, his exploits are, are really legendary. In any case, one day he was flying a D-model Thunderbolt being pursued by some A-model FW-190s, and he couldn't get away from them. They were probably very slowly gaining on him. And so what he did is he overflew a German airfield and just shredded it uh, with his 50 cals as he went over. And then the two FW-190s that were, say, I don't know, nominally a mile or two behind him, were just lit up and shot down by the base's German anti-aircraft fire. And this isn't a unique story. There are cases of, a lot of cases of American aircraft getting shot down by their own anti-aircraft fire. This particular pilot, Mike Gladich, um, he flew a Thunderbolt in this same paint scheme, although with slightly different nose art. He had a penguin on the front. This particular paint scheme is from a Thunderbolt Mike variant, an M model that was flown by a different pilot, but also a Pole named Witold Lenowski. All of these guys that, that were Polish that ended up flying with the U.S. Air Force were pretty wild. First of all, some of them were flying in sort of an unofficial capacity, uh, thanks to Francis Gabrowski, who, who knew them and, and brought them on, and that was a good thing for the U.S. But these guys were incredibly aggressive, or were checking for uh, friendly aircraft right now, and then we'll look for enemy aircraft as well, and just kind of try and keep the big picture on. In any case, the Poles were incredibly aggressive. They had a tremendous, well, not all of them, but a lot of them, including um, Mike Gladish. In fact, they called him Killer Mike. Killer Mike was incredibly aggressive, really hated the Germans. As a matter of fact, it's said that he was under-reporting his kills because he and some of the other Poles feared that the Polish Air Force would pull them back in 
and they would have to do training or desk jobs or other things they didn't want to do. They wanted to keep flying with the Americans in the Thunderbolts because that's where the action was, so to speak. Uh, we're coming into land right now, normal traffic pattern. We're, of course, we're kind of low because we started low. We were flying low altitude all the way here. Uh, landing the Thunderbolt, pretty normal. The only thing I want to mention is put the flaps down in increments. Go to 10 degrees, then to 20, then to 30, and get kind of good at putting them there without actually having to look at anything, and that takes a little bit of practice. You don't want to just put the Thunderbolt's flaps all the way down because if you do, uh, they could come down differentially and cause you a whole problem. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So coming in for the landing and well, that's not too great, but hey, damaged airplane, it's going to have to do. Now once it's on the ground, we're going to roll to a stop and at some point we're going to want to open up the cowl flaps so that the engine can start its cool down period we don't want to overheat the engine on the ground and it will overheat on the ground if you just taxi around with the cowl flaps all the way closed. We'll also open our canopy and we're going to get set up to rearm, refuel, repair. I'm going to shut the video off now and just go to the next section. I don't want to bore you with all of those details. Alright, the airplane's been rearmed, refueled, and the mechanics tell me it's repaired. So we're going to go through our before takeoff checklist. That's a cigar check. Controls, which we're doing now. And next we'll do the instruments. Quite a bit to look at here. I want to take a look at the suction. I'm going to have to bring RPM up a little bit to get the suction to the green arc. Then check magnetic versus directional gyro. It looks okay. Uh, the attitude indicator is a little off kilter, so we'll recage that. Reset it. It should stay put now that it's got enough suction, hopefully. Make a small adjustment to it there. And we're going to look at the engine gauges. They're all okay except oil temperature's a little cold. I don't know why it won't come up. I've sat here for like 10 minutes waiting for this thing. All right, we just checked fuel quantity. Fuel selector valve looks right. Now we're looking at attitude trim. And the R in cigar is run up. We're not doing it. Uh, oil temperature is still low. I have no idea why. It could be a simulator issue. I suppose I could get out and ask the mechanics to deal with this again, but there could be an FW-190 about to come over the horizon and bomb or strafe us. Plus, we've got to get back to Brayhall, so I've decided we're just going to go for it, as you can see here. So we're on the takeoff roll. Thunderbolt's really pretty easy to take off. Um, in DCS, it's much easier than either of the FW-190s, in my opinion. Not really sure how re realistic that is. Um, not the best takeoff. Should have counted with a little more right aileron as I lift it off. Get the canopy closed. You take off with the canopy open in the Thunderbolt. That's kind of interesting, but that's per the manual. And we're going to start our right turn towards Bray Hall. There's that screen shake again. That It's very annoying because you don't know if it's something going wrong with the airplane. Oh, I see some B-17 contrails off in the distance. Good sign. That means there could be another raid on the way to Bray Hall to help finish it off. And about now, I'm starting to check my gauges, and I'm going to pull back to max continuous power, 42 inches and 2550 RPM. And I'm starting to notice that the engine is behaving irregularly. And there we go. See what the tack just did? The tack is going all over the place, which means either the engine is failing or the prop governor's going bad. The gauges show good fuel pressure and oil pressure, so if the engine's failing, it's something mechanically wrong with it, which I'm not going to be able to do anything about. Uh, so I'm hoping it's the prop governor, but I'm also looking for a place to land. Fly the airplane first, as they say. So we'll go to manual pitch, go to increase, and see if we can get our power back. No, we can't. So this airplane is not going anywhere. So maybe that low oil temperature was an indication and the mechanics did not fix things properly at Lassay. So we're not going to trust those guys. We're just going to set the thing down in this field here. Uh, and, well, I doubt these people have a phone. So I think we're going to be walking back to base and unfortunately we're not going to be able to take off from Lasay again because they don't have uh, P-47s there it's just a place you can land and repair so let's get out of this thing and get a new airplane so we're back in our P-47 D-40 we borrowed another one from Witold Lenowski I didn't tell him what happened to the last one I fast forward us to this point where we're very near the German base at Bray Hall we took off from Operatus but the flight's been totally uneventful up until this point. Now we have 
a single 500 pound bomb with a five second delay on it. I wanted something with a good area effect because I'm suspecting we're going to have some trouble even figuring out what target we need to hit because we already hit this base really hard and didn't leave a whole lot left and then a flight of American B-17s bombed it from high altitude and while that's accurate enough to hit you know a certain region in a town it's in other words they would have definitely hit the German HQ but they wouldn't have been able to specifically target half tracks and the like so uh, I'm not sure what we're gonna find here what we'll do is we'll close in on the base and if we see an obvious target we'll light it up otherwise we're gonna have to wait for them to shoot at us so that we know uh, what it is that we're looking for everything's armed our bombs are all set and I don't see any real I don't see anything moving down there so I'm not sure what the status of the base is now just off the left side of the gun site right now at about the 8 o'clock position those low profile buildings are actually the German headquarters that's the outpost and it looks like that building took a very near direct hit by a bomb so that's not the problem nobody shot at us so I don't know what's going on here I don't know if the base is active or not so we're checking intelligence reports and that shows that the German headquarters at Brehal is in fact active so there's something here and we don't know what that still needs to be destroyed for the base to count as destroyed uh, this happens in DCS quite a bit a lot of times you've you know almost knocked out a group of enemy forces but you're trying to find one truck or one half track or whatever it is uh, there's a lot of destruction down there so that's going to be a little bit difficult now as we come around here I'm just looking at every single thing the main buildings the outpost building seems to be destroyed all four guard towers have that shade of green on them it means they're knocked out the half tracks are knocked out this all looks pretty good to me now as we come around I think I'm seeing a truck here, or it could be a half track. Right where there's some curvature on the road, right off the wingtip, right about now, there's, you can just barely see it poking out from under the trees. Uh, that's either a truck or a half track, and I think it's a half track, I'm pretty sure. And I also think it's intact. I'm not sure why it isn't shooting at us. It might be damaged. Uh, in any case, I don't know. Now, without anything on fire, it's really easy to lose your target. Like, it, it seems so simple a minute ago. It's just off the left wingtip, and now try and find it. You know, when you come back around the other direction, you lose your perspective on everything. But I think we'll be able to find it, and what we're going to do is fly down, drop a bomb in that general area. That way, if it's a truck, it'll take it out. If it's a half-track, maybe not, but uh, it'll will give us some idea of what's going on. we got to get rid of the bomb anyway. If the bomb doesn't destroy the target, then we'll come back in for a strafing run. Uh, as I've said before, half-tracks are easy prey for a strafing P-47. All right, so we're coming in. Drop the bomb. Pull up. We do have a five-second delay, but I want zero risk of getting caught up in our own explosion at this point. Okay, so we saw an explosion there. It looks like it started a couple fires, but I don't think either one of them are right where that vehicle I saw was. So we're going to have to go back in and strafe that thing. Either it's something that's already destroyed, or it's something like a half-track or a Puma that uh, the bomb just didn't destroy. So we'll line up here, and we got some smoke here from those fires we started, and we hit, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was a half track now, we hit that pretty hard and now it's on fire so we've got a third fire there I don't know if there's anything left of the base we're gonna get a little bit of distance and then come back in around and reconnoiter the situation first we're gonna check radar and see if there are any enemy fighters that appear to be close to us and it doesn't look like there's anything we need to worry about right away so we'll come back around and oh we just got a message German headquarters at Bray Hall is destroyed so uh, yeah it was just one half track or Puma that was left that's great uh, we hardly used any machine gun ammunition we took no damage and we're pretty fat on fuel so we're gonna head northeast towards uh, St. Lo that's a really busy area there's often a lot of action there and hopefully we'll run into some German fighters now ideally 
for demonstration purposes today, I'd like to run in to an FW190. If it's an FW190A model, that's going to be pretty easy to deal with in the P47, and that's largely a function of the way the, the 190A8 is represented in DCS. It runs uh, relatively low maximum power, 1.42 ATA, and that's not historically incorrect. Okay, There were FW190A8s that were limited to 1.42 ATA, but only for a very short period of time. It's very unlikely one of those planes would have been running up against a 2600 horsepower Thunderbolt. By the time the A8s were running into these airplanes, they would have been running uh, more manifold pressure. But in any case, the way DCS is set up, uh, 190 A8s are, while well, a lot of fun to fly, and I own that module and I love it, um, they're using an A8 from kind of the wrong time period, in my view. They, they need to offer um, a higher manifold pressure version to compete with the Thunderbolt Spitfire 9 and, uh, well, the 9 that's represented in this game, and also certainly the P-51D. Anyway, the 190 Dora 9, that's a threat to us, but we can beat a Dora 9 in a straight-up turn-and-burn dogfight. So we're going to head northeast, look for the enemy, and uh, hopefully find a 190. Now, we may find a 109. 109, we're going to really have our hands full. The situation there is, as you know, the 47 is a great high-altitude fighter. It's, it's really dominant up above 25,000 feet, and against a 109 K4 or not, we're going to tear that up if we fight it up there. But the reality of this map is that unless we're defending B-17s, we're probably not going to be fighting up there. So we're, if we get stuck fighting a 109, it's probably going to be down low, where most of the cars, not all of them, are in the 109's favor. And I, I come out ahead probably more often than not against them, but a really good pilot in a 109 will be a problem. So, what are we going to do if we run into a 109? Well, we can't outclimb him, we can't outrun him, we're probably going to be low, so we can't outdive him. And we can probably outbeat him in roll rate, so scissors will be good for us. And we can, I wouldn't exactly say we can outturn him. Let me put it this way. We have much better flaps than the 109. Our flaps are big, they're slotted, they're just like the flaps in a Corsair, and a Corsair has maneuver positions uh, at 10 and 20 degrees. We have slotted flaps like a Corsair, but officially no maneuver position in the Thunderbolt. Now when you put the flaps down in the Thunderbolt, you want to be really careful because they're not mechanically linked, and the hydraulics can put, even with everything normal airplane, normal day, no damage, the Thunderbolt can put one flap down a little bit faster than the other. So you want to put them down in about 10 degree increments, uh, move the handle to down, count about 1,001, about that fast, and then back to neutral. And that'll give you about 10 degrees. Now, if the plane's taken battle damage, then you can have a situation where only one flap comes down, and that can be really tricky. So if we get into a long, long-lasting turn fight with the 109, where our turn rate and uh, turn radius is becoming a really big deal, then I won't hesitate to go to 10 degrees of flaps, sometimes even 20. Now at 10 degrees of flaps, war emergency power, and about 170 miles an hour, maybe even as slow as 160, we can beat a 109 in a turn, left or right. The thing is, we can only barely do it, and if the 109 pilot is really clever, what he'll do is start climbing until he has enough vertical separation to dive down on us. So uh, that's enough about that. Let's find a plane and put this into action. So I've got a enemy fighter in sight and as luck would have it, or bad luck, it's a 109. I'm going to try and lead him and hit him on the head on pass here, but I end up messing that up. I was not leading him enough and I tried to pull extra lead at the last second and he ducked under. Very good move on his part. Now we're both in right-hand turns, but we're in offset circles, meaning the poles of our circles are centered in very different places, and the result is going to be that we're going to end up head-on here, and I don't want to take a 30 millimeter uh, shot, especially if he's close range and head-on, so I duck that and continue my turn going around. Now he's turning the same way, and he also extended a little bit to increase the offset of the circle. Offset circles are not good for me. They're better for him. The deal with offset circles is that both people will eventually get shots. 
However, the airplane with a better climb rate, in this case the 109, can um, use the vertical to stay out of my gun sight. So his shooting opportunities are going to be better than mine. So this is a bad deal for him. Now I'll take some pot shots here to try and talk him out of this plan. But those are really, uh, really long shots, literally and figuratively. Now you can tell we're in offset circles because the speed of his plane on my canopy will vary a lot. It will go from moving slowly to moving really, really fast. Here we'll take some more shots here. Now if I was using tracers, that might have at least scared him, but he doesn't even know I took those shots unless by some miracle I hit him, and I don't think I did, or if he was looking directly at my muzzle flashes at the time. So the problem here is that his use of the vertical while he's turning, while he's not climbing particularly steeply, he can get up to an altitude. I, I just can't get a shot in on this guy. So this is going to be a problem. So what I'm going to do is work this circle towards his pole. I want to be centered on the same pole he's on and then maintain a tighter radius than him. And that'll make it really difficult for him to get a shot in on me. Now it's not going to solve the problem that I have that I can't get a shot in on him either. But uh, I'm working towards a greater plan here, which is the kind of thing you have to do when you're flying the Thunderbolt. Remember I've got 10 degrees of flaps in there. Now that does hurt my climb performance, but it also is what's preventing him from coming around the circle and getting onto my six. So we'll just keep doing this. Notice how much altitude he's, he's able to gain there when he when he zoom climbs it. And you can see the the fast, slow picture of his, his airplane moving on my canopy is decreasing. That means my plan of getting my circle over to his is working. Now that's not going to get me a shot. It's just going to kind of keep me safe. So I'll maybe try and take another shot here. But yeah, there's just there's just no way. But I'm getting really close to being on his pole. And it looks like I'm getting onto his six. Uh, you know, I kind of am, but not in a way that's effective. I'm just not going to be able to get a shot in on this guy by by doing this. Not a realistic shot. And we're at war emergency power for most of this time. So what I want to do is go to another plan and I want to reduce power to max continuous 44 inches of manifold pressure to start resting my engine for the use of war emergency power later. And I want to get him down to my altitude. Now at the rate the way this is going, right now I'd say we're both on the same pole. He's staying about the same uh, relative speed on the canopy. I can't get a shot, but he can't either. The thing is, eventually, he's going to have enough vertical separation, he's going to be able to come down on me. That's a big problem. So that is why I'm in this now slowly descending turn at max continuous power. So when I hit the deck, I think he'll have enough vertical separation to try and dive on me, but it won't be a very effective attack because the planet's going to be in his way. He can't dive through my altitude if I'm already really low. And better than that, my engine's going to be nice and rested. He's still trying and struggling to get that vertical separation. I'm checking the map there just for big picture stuff. So at this point, I'm going to roll level, try and get some extra speed because I know we may end up into a situation where I need to pull high G's. Uh, again, we're at max continuous manifold pressure. I look back, he seems to have lost sight of me and I think he's reacquired about now but he misjudged things and almost hit the ground, almost got a maneuver kill there. Unfortunately, he's going a lot faster than I am, so he's going to start coming around on me again, and he's not going to be able to get the nose on here. I just have uh, too good of a turn going, so he's not able to get a shot in. It was close, but no cigar. The problem is he was moving awfully fast. He went past us like we were standing still, so he's coming back around for another shot, and if I keep this turn going, had I done that, I would have been in good shape. But I got an accelerated stall, and that resulted in me getting hit there, which is bad. However, what's good is he's now overshooting, and there's nothing he can do about it. He could use flaps in the 109 too, sure, but they're really slow, and that'll introduce other problems for him. So very few 109 pilots will do that, and when they do, it usually doesn't work out well because they can't get them back up when they need to. Not fast enough anyway. So now we're in exactly what I want to be in, other than the fact that we just took some hits. Um, our, we're turning the same direction, our poles are centered on the same spot, and eventually my airplane will come around on his. And 109 pilots 
generally will stay in this turn way longer than they should because they can't believe a Thunderbolt's out turning them. Now the bad news is after we got hit, yeah, I looked down at my gauges really quickly. Oil pressure was fine. I did lose the airspeed indicator. He depressurized the line between the pitot tube and the airspeed indicator. Um, that's okay. I'm not particularly worried about that. I also have a generator failure, which I did not notice, but that won't matter because the battery will certainly last the duration of this fight. So he hit, hit my cowling between the windscreen and the engine and damaged a lot of stuff in there. Generator, uh, some pitot-static tubing, and what I don't know that's really important is he also started an oil leak. My oil pressure was fine when I first checked it, and now it's zero. So that's a big deal. Um, I did see a puff of smoke a few moments ago, and that was a sign of the oil leak. But there's really not much I can do about it. I can't reduce power. I can't get out of this fight. And I know the engine will hold up about five minutes um, from that point. So I'm hoping I can finish this, especially as I'm coming around on him now. And notice he's wobbling a little bit. That means he's really on the performance limit. He's at the edge of his turn performance. I'm not. I can tighten this turn up. I'm going to be able to bring my gun sight onto him as soon as I feel the range is right. I'd like to kill him in one shot here. May not happen. There's some more wobbling. He knows I'm coming around. He's getting nervous. He's trying to pull tighter. He just can't quite do it. Slow and steady is the plan here. So took some shots there. I believe I hit him. Not 100% sure. He goes vertical, not a bad idea, but doesn't have the energy to really pull it off. So I got some strong hits there while he was on the way down. Now, I pulled the power back, trying to save my engine. I shouldn't have done that. That's really going to cost me here. Um, I should have been able to follow him up here and finish him off, but you'll see what happens. I just didn't have enough power in to stay with him, and I get an accelerated stall here at low altitude. That's very bad. Full right rudder, stick forward. We're trying to save this thing. We don't have a lot of altitude. To recover. A minor mistake in stall recovery would have been the end there. Uh, fortunately, I've drilled stall recovery in this airplane over and over. So we're back into this turn, but I've lost sight of them. Now, I don't know it at this particular moment, but it also turns out that he's lost sight of me. Either that or he's decided to take the opportunity to get out of the fight. Maybe my hits that I did were more damaging to him than than I thought. So we see him there and we're pretty hard to see in this situation. I'm very confident he doesn't see us. I'm going to try and get into his blind spot and the issue here is going to be getting some more rounds on target before he gets away because our engine, you know, we've only got, you know, what, another couple of minutes left, maybe three minutes tops. So I'm going to try and get my sights up to him and send some rounds his way. Hopefully we get enough hits so that he panics and starts maneuvering. The smart thing for him to do would be to just keep going. But uh, those rounds, for whatever reason, convinced him to start turning. And we're going to set up and take some shots with our gyro gun sight. The P-47's gyro gun sight is pretty good. I don't think I'm getting hits with these um, sloppy shots I'm doing. But what I'm going to want to do is get the gun sight ranging in just right and pull the gyro pipper, not the boresight pipper that's right on right now, the gyro pipper ahead of him a little bit, squeeze the trigger, let him fly through that. That's a very reliable way to get hits in the Thunderbolt. And that's what I just did. And now he's smoking. And it looks like he's going in. So uh, this fight, yeah, this fight is, is going to be over. There's the parachute. And he's going in. So... Uh, we won that. That's great. But now we've got a whole new problem. We are going to be needing... We need to look for a place to land. Our engine has very little life left in it. And I'm going to pull the power back, uh, manifold pressure and RPM back to try and get what I can out of it. And I'm looking all around to try and figure out where I am. And in a moment here, we'll see St. Lowe. And I know I'm on the wrong side of St. Lowe. St. Lowe is about the very near the border of Allied and German forces. And I really want to ditch this thing in Allied territory. Okay, there's St. Lowe, just to the right of the gun sight. So we're going to head that direction. We're still in German territory, checking to see who's around. Uh, those are just the human players that are on right now. And in DCS, I guess I ought to retract the flaps here. Um, in DCS, if you shoot down an enemy and they, you know, the plane explodes or crashes into the ground or crashes and explodes, whatever, uh, you get a kill. But 
if the plane gets away and lands sometime later and is not, you know, obliterated, then that doesn't count as a lost airframe and it doesn't count as a kill for the other guy. So you generally, uh, in the P-47, you technically don't get shot down a lot. Although, tech, I mean, really, yeah, I've been shot down here. But uh, for DCS purposes, no, I'm not shot down unless I totaled this airplane on, on the crash landing. The 109 pilot doesn't know what he did to me. And uh, for all he knows, I got back to base. Of course, we're not going to get back to base. I'm trying to get some altitude. Uh, trade what little time I have with the engine for altitude to uh, set up a nice glide to get to some place when the engine quits that's as close to St. Lowe as possible. Ideally, I'd like to ditch this thing right in the marshalling yard at St. Lowe, but I know that I don't have the uh, I don't have the life left in my engine to get get there. German forces are just off our left wing there, so uh, those are the German forces at Turigny. We hit those in a different video. All right, uh, St. Lowe's ahead, and our engine is still running by some miracle, which is great. And I'm, again, thinking about a place to land. I want to minimize how far I have to walk. And I, most importantly, I want the airplane to be mostly intact. I don't want it to count as a hull loss on my score. Not that I really keep score on DCS, but, you know, some people do that. If you're into that sort of thing, I guess it matters. Uh, looks like there's nobody around that's going to shoot me down at the, the last minute here. So what we're going to want to do, once the engine fails completely, which it's going to soon, I'm going to want to feather the propeller. And I'm going to do that by going to manual pitch on the prop and holding it to the decrease. There we go. Engine seized. Uh, oil pressure failure will lead to the engine seizing eventually. Okay, so we go to fixed bridge. I go to increase. That's the wrong way, Greg. Okay, there you go. Decrease. And now we're going to turn the blades into the wind to feather it. That'll increase our glide distance. This is not typically seen on single engine airplanes unless they have shared components with multi engine airplanes, which is what you're seeing here. So, props feathered. Now I can glide pretty darn far. The best glide speed in the Thunderbolt varies between about 170, 175 miles an hour, which is about what it is right now, down all the way up to about uh, 220 miles an hour. That would be a Thunderbolt November at a very high weight. And interestingly, your glide range does not decrease with weight. You're just your glide speed goes up. I've always found that to be a, an interesting phenomenon with glide performance. Anyhow, uh, as you can see, we're gliding just fine. I'm probably a little slow, probably down around 150 right now. Hard to know for sure without the airspeed indicator. And I, I see where I want to put the airplane. So uh, the idea here is to get the thing in intact, but uh, I don't quite make it. And I clip that bush and cartwheel the airplane. But again, P-47. So it didn't catch on fire. And I'm okay, so I'm going to shut off the fuel selector, shut off the battery, minimize the chance of this thing catching on fire and ruining what's left of my beautiful P-47. So that's about it for this video. I'll pull up the score here and see how it looks, but I, I know it's going to show that we didn't lose an airplane and that we shot down one and knocked out a lot of ground targets. So it's a pretty successful mission by any realistic standards. Now I want to thank the people that make the Wolfpack server. That's where this fight is. I never run out of stuff to do there. There are there's always enemy aircraft to fight. There's tons of ground attack missions you can fly, anti-shipping, a lot of airplanes. The layout of the server is such that you don't have to fly for 30 minutes after you take off to get to where the action is. It's just, for me personally, it's, it's an ideal server. And I've flown some of the others, and, and the others are good too. It's just, this is the one that I happen to like. Um, of course, thanks to my subscribers, Patreon members, and hey, one interesting thing, in fact, I, I may even put up a poll when I put up this video. Do you think that enemy that I was fighting was a human pilot, or do you think it was an AI flown 109? I think that's an interesting question, and of course, I know the answer now, but I did not know the answer when I was flying the mission. So. Anyway, I'm going to put that poll up, let's see what the results are, and then after it's up for a day or two, I'll put the answer in the description of this video. 
thanks uh, to Patreon supporters, subscribers. I really appreciate every one of you folks. So that's all for now, and have a great day. Into action.